You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. And we will read verses 7 through 11 this morning, Philippians chapter 3. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ." and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, so that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And let's ask God's blessing and help for us as we study this portion of His Word. Let's pray. Father, we do come before You and we are children of dust, feeble and frail. We pray, Father, that You would not hide these things from us, but that You would reveal them to us in Your Word. Give us the illumination of the Spirit and the understanding that can only come from You. And we pray that as a result of our time spent today in Your Word, that You would be glorified here amongst Your people, that You would give to us understanding and send Your Spirit to minister to us and to illuminate Your Word to us. Your Word is truth, it is light, And in the unfolding of your word, there is light to our souls, and we ask that that would be the case this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. After last week, I was asked a question after the service, and the question was, Jim, you mentioned last week that uh, you were such a a critical, pseudo-righteous jerk, and you told us about what life was like in the early years of Bible college and what you were like, but you never described to us how that changed. And so I I figured there's probably other people that were maybe asking the same question. The question being, Jim, you described to us how you were a horribly unlikable big jerk. So how did you go from being a horribly unlikable big jerk to being the mildly unlikable little jerk that you are today? (laughs) Well, that's a fair question and probably one that is on people's minds. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I don't get up here to elaborate on myself or my own life, but I think that the thinking that was in my mind and the transition that took place in my life might be somewhat instructive since, to you since we are dealing with this subject of putting confidence in the flesh and judging other Christians and trusting in our own righteousness to save us or our own acts to make us more righteous. So here's the thinking in my mind years ago when I first started living for the Lord. Here is what I think was going on in my heart. Now, Ultimately, the heart is deceitful above all things, and we cannot ever really even know the condition of our own heart. Much as we think we might try, we can't know really where our own heart is and what our own heart is doing, because it is that deceitful and desperately wicked. But here's my assessment of what was going on in my mind and my heart. When I first started living for the Lord, I went and I went to Bible college. I was surprised to find out when I showed up at Bible college that I was the most ignorant student out of everybody else in the 40 students that were there for my first year. When I went to Bible college, I knew nothing. And I'm not, that's not an exaggeration. I knew nothing. I had come to Sunday school, but hadn't paid attention. I had come to youth group, but hadn't paid attention. I had come to church, but hadn't paid attention. And any teenager that is here in this church who has the benefit of sitting under the teaching of, of Jamie and Lisa Slippy and Dave Rich is light years beyond where I was at when I was 18 and went to Bible college. I was the single most ignorant student on campus. And I had to learn. I didn't have the benefit of the Christian upbringing that other students had. Most of those students had pastors for fathers. Most of them had been raised in the church. They had gone to Sunday school. They had heard all the Bible stories. They knew doctrine. Some of their parents had gone to that school. Some of their parents and grandparents had gone to that school. Some of the kids in my class were staff kids, so their parents taught at the school. Other kids were children of famous missionaries, world-renowned missionaries. And so I didn't have the benefit of a Christian upbringing. I didn't have the benefit of all of the education and assignments that would take other students 10 minutes to complete would take me hours 
because I had to learn what they already knew in order to learn what they were learning. So I had to work three times as hard as anybody else. And and I think that in my thinking, I thought that my lack of knowledge, I could make up for my lack of knowledge with an outward show of piety. So in the back of my mind, I think what I was thinking was, all of these students may be light years beyond where I'm at in knowledge-wise, but I will show them who's pious. I will show them that I could be the most righteous-acting, righteous-sounding, righteous-looking student on all of the campus. And I wasn't just going to match my classmates. I was going to exceed my classmates. And so I had all of these structures, all of these lists of do's and don'ts, and I was going to show them how outwardly pious I could be. And everybody, even though they may not envy my upbringing, may not envy my intellect, they would envy my piousness and my outward show of righteousness, at least what I thought righteousness was. That went really good for the first year, halfway through the second year. And during the second year, there was a student that returned to the college who, he was in third year, and he had he'd gone to year, uh, school there a couple years prior. I hadn't set, met him yet. He showed up for his third year to finish out his education. I was in second year, and his name was Bill. Bill Hamilton, one of the nicest, the single nicest guy, funnest guy to be around on campus. Everybody on campus loved Bill. Everybody loved hanging around with Bill. Bill was a great guy. I loved Bill. Now, I thought Bill was a liberal because Bill listened to the Beach Boys. And so I thought he was a theological liberal and obviously had no morals and had no no outward piety like I had. So I considered myself above Bill, even though he was far more likable than I was. And Bill would come to my dorm room and we would get into these long discussions together on different issues of my legalism and the things that I was uh, trying to make everybody else live up to and my own standards of righteousness. And and we'd go back and forth and Bill would confront me on things and I would go back with him and, and not yield a gra- an inch of ground. Likeable, we were good friends, but... Back and forth we went. Finally, Bill, one time, about halfway through my sec- my first semester there, he arrived back from a trip into town, and he had a little white book in his hand, and it was a paperback, and he said, have you ever read this, have you ever seen this book? And the title of the book was The Grace Awakening by Chuck Swindoll. And I said, no, I've never seen it. He said, do you know who Chuck Swindoll is? And I said, never heard of him. And he said, well, you really need to read this book, because this deals with some of the things that we've talked about, and legalism. And he said, Jim, I'm just, I'm giving you the book. You, you read the book and we'll discuss some of the things in it. And if in reading that book, you think he's off the reservation, fine. But just give it a hearing, give it a listen, and come back and we'll talk. So I took it and I thought, Chuck Swindoll, probably some liberal antinomian who has no moral standards whatsoever and is out trying to teach Christians that there's no standards of righteousness and they should be able to do whatever they want. And I actually looked forward to reading the book so that I could refute Chuck Swindoll and say, Ha, I told you he was a liberal antinomian. And I could go back and say this to Bill. Long story short, the book changed my life. And Chuck Swindoll's teaching in that book set me free from a very dark, very joyless, very critical, very pseudo-righteous life of legalism as an early, as a, as a newer Christian and just living for the Lord. That happened halfway through my second year. So that's how that happened. And that's why I was the way I was. And that's what changed it. And the change in my life was remarkable enough that I was known in my third year and my second year as somebody that had been revolutionized by being set free from legalism. And that's how it happened for me. Now, that question came up because we're looking at Ephesians, sorry, Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at that text. And last week we looked at all of the ways that Christians put their trust in the flesh, their confidence in the flesh. We do it for salvation, thinking that there are things that we can do to earn God's favor. And non-Christians do this. The Judaizers of Paul's day did this. They boasted in their circumcision. The Jews boasted in their heredity. We're of Abraham's descendants. And the Apostle Paul lists in verses 4-6 to all of the things that he could have placed his confidence in. But Paul says, all those things that were gained to me I have counted loss. And then we also applied that same principle of putting our confidence in the flesh to the area of sanctification. How is it that we as Christians think we can improve upon the righteousness that we have on the basis of faith? Well, we do it in all kinds of different ways when we judge each other in non-essential issues and issues of Christian liberty and we set up extra-biblical man-made structures of righteousness that we think other people have to live up to and attain and then we criticize and judge them as being not as righteous in the sight of God, or we think that we can improve upon or add to our righteousness in God's sight 
by different things that we do. And I made the distinction last week, and let me make it again. We're not talking about areas of open, undeniable immorality and sin. I'm talking about what's called the adiaphron, the debatable issues, the gray areas, the, the areas of liberty in the Christian life. And there are plenty of them. And then we also looked at how it is that Christians place their confidence in the flesh by somehow thinking that although God has made me righteous, and although maybe I cannot add to that righteousness, I might be able to lose that righteousness and thus my salvation. And so I'm trusting in something that I do to keep me saved. Those are all ways that we place confidence in the flesh. Well, verse 8 of chapter 3 is sort of the Apostle Paul taking the principle of verse 7, he, in verse 8, he takes that same principle, those things that were gained to me, I have counted as loss, and he ratchets it up a notch. He restates the same thing, but in far stronger terms and far more encompassing terms. And there are a few things here that we can learn as well. Now, I want you to follow Paul's back and forth in verses 7, 8, and 9. And here it is. Everything that was gained to me for my righteousness in the sight of God, I have counted that as loss. That's gaining and losing, so that I may have Christ. Then in verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, more than that, furthermore, all things, not just those things that I considered as gain, but all things I have counted as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. Then he goes back to the gaining and losing analogy again, and he says, I have suffered the loss of all things, but at least I have Christ. What was gain, I've counted as loss, and I got Christ. I've counted all things as loss in the view of surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. And I have lost all things, but in the end I get Christ. Now the Apostle Paul is not going to leave us on the note of losing. Look at verse 9, because verses 9, 10, and 11, which we'll start into next week, are all verses that describe what we gain. What does it mean to gain Christ? Well, verses 9, 10, and 11 describe that. When we gain Christ, we are found to be in Him with a righteousness that is not our own. It's a righteousness that's not derived from anything we do, and it's a righteousness that's not derived from the law, but it is a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of what Christ did, and it comes to us through faith. And then verse 10, when we gain Christ, we know Him, We know the fellowship of His sufferings. We know the power of His resurrection. We are conformed to His death and we gain the resurrection of the dead. All of that is gain. Verses 9, 10, and 11 is all of the things, the surpassing value of what we gain when we are willing to count everything as loss. So let's look at verse 8. The principle stated in verse 7 is, everything that was gained to me I've counted as loss so that I may gain Christ. Verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, more than that, that is to say, He's taking it up a whole nother level. More than that, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. I count all things as loss. The word count that Paul uses there, it's in the present tense indicating that this was not something that Paul at one time thought and now he doesn't think this anymore. It's not something that Paul was in some day hoping to be his perspective. This was for Paul present tense. I have counted all things as loss, and I continue to consider it all as loss. And the word count there refers to not just a a mental change of mind, it refers to a careful, deliberate, decision-making process. It is evaluating something in the light of truth. It refers to not a, a whimsical flash decision that you make in a heated moment. It refers to a deliberate, carefully thought out, carefully drawn conclusion and a decision that you make. I consider, I count, I think, I have carefully judged all of these things to be lost. Now what's significant about this observation is that the Apostle Paul is speaking in the context of salvation. He's talking about salvation. In other words, counting all things as lost for the sake of Christ, being saved and putting all of your past human righteousnesses and all of your human accomplishments in the trash bin so that you may have Christ's righteousness is not something that somebody does like that in the heat of an emotional moment. It's not something that people do while we pray uh, play through just as I am a hundred times and appeal for everybody to come forth and whip up the emotion in the sanctuary so that people make an emotional decision. 
Salvation is a carefully thought out decision to turn my back on my own righteousness and trust instead in Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Friends, there are a lot of people who come to Christ, and I use that term loosely, come to Christ in the heat of an emotional moment as a rash, sort of knee-jerk, emotional decision because Jesus is presented to them as the latest fad. He's the latest thing. You want peace? You want fulfillment? You want lasting happiness? You want lasting joy? Well, God has a man-shaped hole in His heart, and you have a God-shaped hole in your heart, and if you come to Jesus, all the holes will be filled. And that's what some people think the Gospel is. And so in a, in a flash, in an emotional moment, in an erratic sort of knee-jerk response, people come to Christ, we'll give this Jesus thing a whirl. It's like I saw on a bumper sticker. I actually saw this bumper sticker. Give Jesus a try, and if you don't like Him, the devil will always take you back. Well, friends, that's horrible theology. That's not even remotely funny. That's a tragedy. To carry that around on your Christian car is a tragedy. The devil's not going to take you back. And once you come to Jesus, you'll never be back to the devil. But that's the mentality that some people have. We're just going to give the Jesus thing a whirl, and if that doesn't work out, the problem with that is that when somebody makes a rash decision like that to try the Jesus thing, you know what happens? The next time something new and flashy and trendy comes along, they're going to jump off the Jesus thing and they're going to try that thing. And so we have churches that are filled with backsliders and homes that are filled with backsliders. Is salvation just a quick, whimsical decision that you make? What did Jesus say? You read it in Luke chapter 14. What did He say? It's like a man who says, I'm going to build a tower. Does that man just rush out and pour a foundation and start throwing lumber onto it? No, Jesus said. He sits down and He thinks to Himself, Do I have the resources and do I have the time to finish this if I start it? And he counts the cost and he thinks to himself, what is this going to cost me? What am I willing to give up? Am I able to see this through all the way to the end? And am I willing to see this through all the way to the end? And if he doesn't do that, then he will begin his, he will begin his building project and halfway through find out why I didn't count the cost. I didn't know what this was going to cost me. So he gives up and then everybody around him mocks him. Or Jesus said it's kind of like a king who when an enemy king is coming against him, he doesn't just rush out into battle with his 10,000 troops. He sits down and he puts together a battle plan and he asks himself, am I able to take one coming against me with 20,000 with my 10,000 troops? And he assesses his own strength and the strength of his enemy and he sits down and he carefully counts and considers the cost and determines, am I willing to see this through to the end? You don't rush out and put your life and the life of your men in danger in a rash military decision. You sit it down and you count the cost. Jesus said that's the way it is with discipleship. And He said, if you are not willing to give up all your possessions and hate your mother and your father and your brother and your sister and your wife and your children and your own life, then you cannot be My disciple. It's going to cost you something. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I have considered, I have counted it all as loss. The Gospel is not something you just jump on because it's the latest bandwagon. The Gospel and being a disciple of Christ is something where you stop and you look at it and something has to go on up here mentally where you say to yourself, I cannot and I will not trust any of my own righteousness, but I will trust in Christ and Christ alone and I am willing to pay whatever cost He may ask of me. Does that mean that you can't have possessions? It's not what it means. But if the Lord asks you to give up your possessions, are you willing to do it? If you're not, you can't be His disciple. Does it mean that you have to die as a martyr? doesn't mean that, but if the Lord asks you to die, you must be willing to die. Does it mean that you can't stay home, that you have to go to a foreign mission field and be a missionary and give up all of the advantages and the comforts and the conveniences of home? doesn't necessarily mean that, but if the Lord asks you to do it, you're willing to do it. That's what it means to count the cost. That's what Paul says when he says, I have counted it, I have considered it, I have evaluated it, and my settled careful, deliberate judgment is that all of these things are loss. Now when Paul says all things, I have counted all things as loss, what is he referring to? I'll give you a hint. It's all things. It's all things. In verse 7, when he says everything that was gained to me, I have counted as loss, I've considered that as loss, he was referring to all of the advantages of his heredity and all of the advantages of his hard work listed in verses 4-6. to But when the Apostle Paul says more than that, beyond just those things that I listed about being circumcised the eighth day and born of the nation of Israel, 
beyond all of thing, all of those things, I have counted all things as lost. Material possessions. My house, my car, my clothes, my wife, my children, my comforts, my conveniences, my job, my tools, my toys, my trees, my everything. I have counted it all as loss. And what the Apostle Paul is describing is that perspective in your mind where you look at Christ and you say, He is worth more to me than everything else because I have counted all things in my life as loss. Now, was that a fool's bargain for Paul? Was that a fool's trade? Not as far as, not as, far as Paul was concerned. Because look what he says, I do that in view of what? The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The surpassing, huper echo, the excelling, the exceeding, the above and beyond value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, is there anything that the world can offer you or anything that the world has ever offered you which can compete with knowing Christ? And Paul would have instantly, without even having to think about it, say, hands down, nothing. There is nothing that surpasses the value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And friends, this is the unique thing about Christianity. Only Christianity and only the New Testament and only the Bible tells us that we can know God personally. Every other religious system says you can be acceptable to God if you do this. You can know about God. You can become part of God. You can... Um, you can know some things about God, but never the gnosis, never that intimate knowledge that the Bible talks about, which that intimate knowledge which is gained through experiencing someone or something, that gnosis. Only Christianity says you can know God on a personal level because He is a personal being that can relate to you as a person. That's what makes Christianity unique. And that's the type of knowledge that Paul is describing. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. John chapter 17 verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what knowledge is. The knowledge that we have of God is to know accurately who God is and to be in a personal relationship with Him. I almost don't even like that terminology anymore because it is so distorted in evangelicalism, but to have a personal knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and to know Him personally, that is to have eternal life. And so that is far more in value. Knowing Christ is of greater value than anything else that the world could ever offer us or will ever offer us. I count it all as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. The knowing of Christ was more than adequate compensation for all that the Apostle Paul lost. Think about that for just a second. Knowing Christ was more than adequate compensation for all that the Apostle Paul had lost. Now what did he lose? The Apostle Paul says, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have what? I have suffered the loss of all things. There's a little bit of a word play in the Greek that comes out in the English. In the Greek, two prior times, the Apostle Paul used the noun form of the word loss. I have counted it all as a loss, a noun, the loss. But here, the Apostle Paul actually uses the verb form. It's a little turn of a phrase. And he says, I have suffered the loss. And the word means, I have been fined. The word literally means to be fined. To suffer a deprivation or to suffer a deprivation. To suffer a fine or to be fined. For Christ, I have been fined all things. Now I just want to stop for a second. If the Lord ever asks you to give up something, or if the Lord ever takes something from you, it is far easier for you to deal with it if, before that ever happens, you have already come to the settled conclusion that everything is lost. Does that make sense? If in your mind you have already said, it's all lost to me, Whatever the Lord may take, it's all loss. Just as long as I have Christ and I have Him for eternity, then that's gain to me. And that's surpassing value. Then when the Lord says, okay, Osman, I want this, and He takes it, it's going to be much easier for me to deal with it if I've already considered it loss. But if you say in your mind, I will consider all of these things as gain, and I will love them all, and I will have them all, and I will idolize them all, and I will take them all, then when the Lord takes them from you, 
then you have to go through the process in your mind of finally recognizing that it's all lost, or you have to get very bitter with the Lord for taking it from you. Because Paul never once complained about being suffering the loss of anything. He didn't complain about suffering that loss. Why? He had already considered it lost. So if you've lost everything and the Lord takes something from you, what have you lost? You haven't lost anything, have you? And the Lord can take everything, but if you've already lost everything in your mind, then when He takes it from you, what have you lost? You haven't lost anything. But if you consider it all gain and consider it all yours and you hold on to it all, then when the Lord takes it, you've lost a lot. But not if already in your mind you've counted it all as lost. It's kind of an, 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 an mysterious. It's kind of a mysterious statement that the Apostle Paul makes, and I wish he would have elaborated on it just a little bit. What does he mean when he says, I have suffered the loss of all things? What was the all things that the Apostle Paul had suffered the loss of? You say house? Well, could be house. You don't really have a house. Especially after Acts 13 where he goes on mission trips and traveling around, he really didn't have any place that he stayed. Physical possessions, yeah, I'm sure he lost a lot of that. But beyond that, when Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things in the context, what does he just describe that was gained to him? Being born of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. Do you ever ask yourself the question, how did the parents of this young, brilliant Pharisee respond when he came to Christ? How did Paul's parents handle that? Paul says in Acts 23, I think it's verse 6, I am a Pharisee born a son of Pharisees. Now, if Paul's dad was a Pharisee and Paul's grandfather was a Pharisee, if Paul's grandfather was still alive and his dad was still alive and his brother and his sister and his mom, how did his family respond when he all of a sudden came back and said, look, it's all lost to me. I want Christ and Christ alone. Interesting first weekend around the dinner table, right? Sitting there eating eating your lamb chops and the subject comes up. Did Paul suffer the loss of his family? Do you remember, I think it's in Acts 23, there was a plot on Paul's life. And back when we were in the book of Acts, a couple years ago, when we were um, looking at Acts 23, there was a plot on Paul's life. Who was it that foiled the plot and came and told Paul and then told the commander that was in charge of Paul? Do you remember who it was? It was his nephew. And I asked you back then, how did Paul's nephew find out about a plot on his life? Is it possible, and I think it's not only possible, but probable, is it possible that the Apostle Paul's extended family was so ashamed of the disgrace he had made of their family and their family name that some of them were involved in the plot or at least knew of the plot to take his life. And that the nephew found out and then came and told Uncle Paul and ended up saving his life. Is that possible? What did Gamaliel think? What did Gamaliel think of one of his most prized students? Did he lose his family? Lose his mom and dad? Some have suggested that the Apostle Paul was married until he came to Christ and that then his wife divorced him. Possible, I don't think likely, but that's possible. He lost his reputation. He lost any hopes for worldly advancement. He lost any hopes of ever being a Pharisee, ever being accepted by the people that he once thought he was the the rising star of Judaism, this wise, young, zealous Pharisee who sat at the top of the Jewish world. He lost all of that. You think the Apostle Paul knows what it's like to be excoriated by your family for knowing Christ? Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, was that a, was that a fool's trade? No. Because Paul says, I count them as rubbish. And the word is scubalon. I count them as scubalon. It's a very colorful, very descriptive word that Paul uses. We're uncertain about its derivation. We don't know how the word first started to become used or or where it came from, but we're absolutely certain about what it means. Scubalong referred to rubbish or waste, excrement, and dung. Very colorful word. I consider them all as scubalong. Everything I have, everything I could be, everything I have lost, I have already in my mind made up the decision, all of that belongs on the dung heap. Now, there may be a little bit of a double entendre here, a little bit of a double meaning in Paul's words, because the word scubalon referred to uh, sometimes table scraps that were thrown out on the dung heap, on the scubalon heap. 
So you refer to you sat around and you ate your dinner and any scraps that were left over, you threw it out on the dung heap, out on the scrap pile, and that scubalong would go out there and all of the dogs would hang around and they would eat up the scubalong off the dung pile. That's why dogs were unclean. Now a little bit of a double meaning here. What did the Apostle Paul refer to uh, as, uh, how did the Apostle Paul refer to those who trusted in such things back in verse 2? He referred to them as what? Dogs. So here's the possible double meaning. These Judaizers who trust in all of their outward works of righteousness and all of their human achievements and all of their human deeds, they are dogs. But me, on the other hand, I have taken all of that dog waste and I've thrown it out on the dung heap for the dogs. So all the Judaizers, they drool over those things. They long to have all of those things off the dung heap of my life. Things that they would look at me and say, oh, if I could only have that type of pedigree. If I could only have that type of heredity. If I could only have those type of achievements. Paul says, I've counted them all as dung, thrown them out on the dung heap, and the dogs come up and they gobble them up and think they're worth something. I hate to belabor the point anymore, talking about excrement, because that's what the word is. But I do want you to see, friends, that this is not the Apostle Paul's evaluation solely of what he had. This is also God's value on these things. This is also God's perspective on human attempts at righteousness. It's excrement. It is as the apostle, sorry, it is as Isaiah says, the prophet Isaiah, filthy rags. All our human righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And if you want a disgusting metaphor, look into what Isaiah was talking about when he talked about filthy rags. That's a disgusting metaphor. It is as if when you say to, when you say to yourself or to somebody else or to me, when you think to yourself, I will make myself acceptable to God on the basis of what I can do. I will try my best to keep the Ten Commandments. I will try my best to, to not murder anybody and do my best and hopefully all my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds at the end of my life and the Lord will let me in. What you are saying to yourself and to God is that you intend to step up to the gates of heaven and offer to the Lord a shovel full of excrement and say, you ought to be pleased to let me in. Because in the Lord's eyes, all of our human righteousnesses and all of our attempts at making ourselves righteous, keeping ourselves righteous, or making ourselves more righteous is a shovel full of dung. And it is an insult and a putrid, stinky, disgusting insult in the eyes and the nostrils of God for us to suggest or to think that we can offer any kind of righteousness to Him with which He would be pleased. It's all a dung heap. It's all a dung heap. Anything that you can do to be righteous, you can't do to be righteous. Because it's a dung heap. Friends, that is why people who think they can get into heaven by being good cannot get into heaven by being good because all of their good deeds come from the dung heap. And is taking a shovel full and dropping it at the gate of heaven and saying, let me in, God, you ought to be proud to have me on your team. And he's not at all pleased with that. That's God's evaluation of human righteousness. And now I ask you this question. What fool would trade Christ for dung? What fool, what kind of a fool is it that so loves their dung that they are willing to trade Christ for that. What type of a fool is that? How foolish is it to love this world over the next? To love my righteousness over His righteousness? To love my deeds over His deeds? What kind of a fool wants to trade Christ for those things that are fit only to be thrown on the scubalon heap? The heap of dung and excrement and food waste. No fool would make such a trade. But friends, when you love things and you love this world and you love your own accomplishments and you love your own righteousness and you love your own list and you love your own deeds and you think you can make it to heaven on your own, you are in essence trading dung for Christ. Imagine the insult to you if I walked up with a shovel full of dung and I said, I'll trade you this for your new car. Would you be insulted? Now in my mind, I may think that I'm holding out a shovel full of diamonds. You may value these things as diamonds, but that doesn't make them diamonds. They're still dung. And only a fool looks at the dung and says, these are diamonds. And this is as valuable as diamonds. And yet in terms of our righteousness, in terms of loving this world, that's exactly what we do. We're going to look next week, verses 9 
through 11 at what we gain in Christ. And I close with Psalm 73, and I want you to listen to this carefully. Psalm 73, verses 25 to 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? It's a good question. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your works. The nearness of my God is my good. Whom have I in heaven but you? And what else could I desire on earth but Christ? There is nothing, there is nothing that the world could ever offer us, ever has offered us, or ever will offer us that compares to the value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else, friends, you got to be able to say it now, everything else goes on the dung heap. So that when you suffer the loss of it, it's not loss. Suffering the loss of anything that goes on the dung heap just brings you more of Christ. And that is of surpassing value and surpassing worth. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this reminder from Your Word that our righteousness is nothing before You, that we have nothing to offer to You. We have nothing that is gain. And Lord, I pray that You would open our eyes to see that everything that we truly value is of nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. All of the affliction, all of the suffering, no matter how long, no matter in what form it takes, and no matter how often it comes, is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. And there is nothing that we could ever lose that will ever surpass the value of our Lord. We thank You for His exceeding majesty, His exceeding value. And we pray, O God, that You would make to each one of us Christ as precious as He is, that He would be precious to us and that we would love Him more than anything else and value Him more than anything else. In order that You might be glorified through us and pleased with us, we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.